Uh, anyway, I would like to introduce our dignitaries, uh, members of the Planning Commission and the City Council. I'll start the closest one to me. Uh, Council Member Etta Waterfield, uh, Council Member Michael Motes, Council Member Michael Cordero. I think that's three. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Okay, and members of the Planning Commission, we have uh, Robert Dickerson, Tom Lopez, and Chairman Tim Seifert. Did I miss anyone? Okay, I think that's it. Round of applause, please. I'm Philip Simcoe, Assistant City. Um, sorry, you can't hear. It's the fans, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can move up. Oh, okay, I'll try. I'll try. Um, <clears throat> I'm Philip Simcoe, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, tonight with me, I have some very special guests. Uh, came all the way from Sacramento to. Uh, make a presentation and answer your questions. Uh, farthest uh, to my right is Ramon Diaz and Rosalba Chavez from the Employment Development Department. And the man closest to me is Cesar Ponce from the Housing and Community Development Department of the state of California. Uh, the EDD will be presenting first and giving a a 10,000 foot overview of the HCD, or excuse me, <laughs> H2A uh, program. Uh, and then we have the expert in the housing regulations who will be also doing a presentation. And with no, without any further ado, I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to uh, uh, Mr. Diaz uh, of the EDD. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Ramon Diaz. I am the manager of the Agricultural Services Unit at the Foreign Labor and Agricultural Outreach Group out of the Sacramento Office and uh, Employment Development Department. And I think, uh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Maybe I should take it, move this. How's this? Okay, good. Um, so we are gonna give you a very high level overview of what our role is in this H-2A process. Uh, we're just a part, one of the um, several other agencies that are involved with the H-2A program, as you will find out. So our objectives for today are to provide a background of the foreign labor certification program and its administrators, describe the H-2A program eligibility and process, explain the foreign labor and agricultural outreach group foreign labor certification responsibilities. So we're going to provide a background first. And uh, first, what is the H-2A program? It is a H-2A program is authorized under the immigration in uh, Nationality Act and allows U.S. employers to hire foreign workers on a temporary basis to perform agricultural work when there is a shortage of U.S. workers available. So that's the whole purpose. That's what it is. It's to bring in uh, foreign workers into the United States and in this case California when there is a proven shortage of U.S. domestic workers. But these are some of the other uh, agencies that are involved at the federal level. We have the uh, Congress that uh, appropriates uh, funding for this program. And then we have the Department of Labor, who is who we work more closely with. And then we also have Department of Homeland Security that's also involved in this process and the Department of State. So as you can see, there's uh, a number of other agencies. Under the Department of Labor, 
there's the Chicago National Processing Center. That's where your application, if an employee is submitting an H-3 application, that's where those applications would go after they uh, submit the job order to us to conduct uh, recruitment of U.S. workers. Then the employer would send it to the Chicago National Processing Center and uh, under the Department of Labor. Also under the Department of Labor, we have the uh, Wage and Hour Division who enforces the terms and conditions of the H-2A employment contract. They're the enforcement arm of the H-2A program. So at the state level, we have the Employment Development Department and under the Workforce Services Branch, which is where we are at, uh, Central Office Workforce Services Division in Sacramento headquartered uh, is where we are at. You will also still, during this presentation, hear state workforce agency. That's really just the Employment Development Department because this program is uh, nationwide. It's a federal program. And uh, Department of Labor refers to uh, uh, state workforce agencies. In this case, in California, is the Employment Development Department. So the, I'm going to abbreviate the FLOW group staff, which is the Foreign Labor and Agricultural Outreach Group in Sacramento, my group. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we follow uh, H-2A federal regulations for the H-2A program. And we assist agriculture employees with the uh, job order review process. Okay, so we assist all the California Ag employers. You submit the job order to us. So just a little uh, background on how, how fast and how much the H-2A program has grown in the last, uh, just the last few years, five, seven years. If we look at fiscal year 2010 and 11, we had a little bit over 2,000 uh, openings under the H-2A program. Uh, today, well, fiscal year 2016-17, we had uh, over 16,000 and by the end of this fiscal year, we will probably surpass that and probably may even surpass 20,000. So it's growing rapidly. And uh, I really don't know if it's going to stop anytime soon, but it's continuing to grow, as you can see, throughout the years. So you get a pretty good idea. So this is a visual for you to uh, uh, kind of assess or uh, uh, look at the growth of the H-2A program in the several areas in California. The darker green, you will see that that's the areas where the H-2A program is more densely concentrated. The lighter areas, of course, that's where there's less H-2A uh, presence. So as you can see, uh, Monterey County, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, the, the, the coastal, central coastal area uh, is uh, heavily populated with the uh, job openings for H-2A employment. But uh, even with that, the total number of employment under the H-2A program uh, um, of workers is only considered not even 2% of the uh, employment of ag workers in California. So it's a very minimal percentage of a workforce in the ag industry, representing less than 2%. So we're going to describe the H-2A program eligibility process, and I'm going to have uh, Rosalba cover that. All right. Thank you, Roman. All right, so we'll be going over the H-2A uh, program eligibility and process. So there are some general guidelines in order to be able to participate in this federal program. The first one is you have to be an employer. Uh, the work that's going to be conducted must be in agricultural in nature. And the work has to be at least part-time, or excuse me, full-time, at least 35 hours on a weekly basis. And the work must be seasonal or temporary in nature. So this is kind of a, a general uh, timeline for the H-2A program. So when there is an agriculture employer who's interested in participating in this program, they have to submit their ETA Form 790 to our department 70, 75 to 60 days before the date of need. 
So at that point, we start reviewing the application. Once we accept their application, then they go ahead and submit it to the Department of Labor at 45 days. Uh, within the 44 to 32 day mark, the employer then starts rec the recruitment process. So what that means is, at this point, the Department of Labor has already given the approval to the agricultural employer to go ahead and start recruitment. So then they, oh, excuse me, then they go ahead and uh, receive a, a certification notice. And when they receive their, the certification notice, that means that the employer has already uh, been, um, they've already had their housing inspected. Uh, they have already submitted their recruitment report to the Department of Labor. And now they have been given the go from the Department of Labor and on the certification notice, they have been notified of the number of workers that they are able to bring in from the uh, foreign country. Then at this point, the employer goes ahead and proceeds with the uh, USCIS. They submit their application with them. And just around 10 days before the, the date of need, the employer then uh, starts submitting their applications with the US Embassy. And they start assigning those uh, H-2A visas to those foreign workers to begin entry to the United States. So when we receive the ETA 790, we look for numerous things. As uh, may, many of you know, we, uh, the employer has to provide certain assurances to those workers. Uh, so we definitely ensure that those, that those assurances are very clear on the ETA form 790, as well as ensuring that the combination of duties makes sense. Uh, the employer has to provide only one job order per, um, Per, per duty, so harvesting and anything that entails with the harvesting of strawberries, for example, uh, it has to be just one job order. And we want to make sure that there's no restrictive language, so we want to ensure that as we're assisting the Department of Labor with testing the labor market, that the um, employers are not using any language that may prohibit a U.S. worker from applying. We also ensure that the transportation that's being used to transport the workers from the housing site to the work sites also meets uh, state uh, uh, codes and regulations. And the employer also has to provide meals, either free kitchen facilities or three meals a day. And uh, if the employer's providing those meals, then we ensure that the employer has a, uh, something in place, like a catering contract. Uh, the housing rental agreements is also something that we look into. And the, uh, we want to make sure as well that the employer, if they want to uh, collect some funds for either uh, misuse um, of tools or equipment, that it abides by the California wage order 14-2001. And then, of course, over time. As the season sometimes, you know, reach the peak season. There's also long hours, and the employer needs to abide by the California law on that. So we assist the Department of Labor in administering this program at, this, at the state level. Uh, with that being said, really our role here is to ensure that we test the labor market. Uh, so not only does the employer have to also do their own independent recruitment efforts, but we as well have to assist the employer in recruiting U.S. workers. So what that means is, is that we go ahead and open a job order into our labor exchange system, CalJobs, and we start recruitment for them. So if there's any uh, farm worker that is interested in applying, they go to our local offices and we go ahead and connect them with the, uh, with the employer. Uh, the, as mentioned uh, the employer also has to conduct their own independent recruitment so they have to advertise in several newspapers and uh, ensure that they're also uh, putting in some efforts contacting the workforce that they also had in the previous season is also another responsibility that the employer has so this is uh, just a general uh, image here of what the recruitment of U.S. workers look, looks like. So uh, 
as, as EDD, or the Foreign Labor and Agricultural Outreach Group, is FLAO, as Roman indicated earlier. Uh, we notify the local offices that there has been a new job order that has been opened, an H-2A job order. We let them know that they can go ahead and start the recruiting um, at a state level. And once the EDD representative connects the worker to the employer, then they go ahead and uh, do the interview process and hopefully hire that U.S. worker to um, work that job order. All right, so our, our last objective here is to explain the FLAO Group Foreign Labor Certification responsibilities. So other than uh, reviewing the H-2A job orders, we also uh, assist the Department of Labor in administering the H-2B uh, job orders, and those are non-AG. We also conduct housing inspections. Uh, we also conduct prevailing wage and prevailing practice surveys. So what that means is, is we want to ensure that the the employers, the H-2A employers, are abiding by what the non-H-2A employers are offering their domestic workers. And we also conduct random field checks, uh, which means that we go out there and ensure that the employers are in compliance. Uh, we're not enforcement, but we, we are mandated to elevate any complaints or any, any uh, substandard working conditions to the appropriate entities. And we also provide technical assistance to all of our local offices throughout the state. So providing them with knowledge and providing them with resources is what we also do. And as I mentioned, we also elevate H2A related complaints. So any substandard working conditions, housing, we, we will elevate those to the appropriate entities. So this is just a, a, a map that kind of illustrates where our housing inspectors um, are located and the areas that they cover. So the northern area, of course, is is pretty uh, large area, but uh, there's the number of work is is a lot less than than like the northern LA coastal divisions. So we have uh, five five uh, housing inspectors currently. So regarding the housing, we, as of May 15th of this year, uh, there was a huge change that occurred between uh, EDD and H HCD. Uh, we stopped conducting housing inspections for employers who house five or more workers. So all the sheep herding and all of the general ag that houses workers uh, four or less are inspected by our office. So EDD and HCD, we are definitely uh, collaborating efforts to ensuring that the employers are providing uh, safe housing that meets uh, state uh, regulations. So we um, hopefully will both provide you with some good background knowledge on what we both do regarding that. So this concludes our presentation today. So we uh, went over the background of the H-2A program and its administers. We also uh, went over the eligibility and process as well as uh, our responsibilities within the foreign labor certification. Uh, thank you, Rosalba. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Mayor Patino joined us. Um, please welcome her. Um, and if you have any questions that you want to have priority, we have note cards in the back, you can write them down, and we will ask those first, and if we have time, which we probably will, we'll go to the open mic after, um, after the, the presentation. Uh, next up is Cesar Ponce from the Housing and Community Development Department, and I'll help you, or you, you actually can do that. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. So 
Thank you for having, for having us, for inviting us. My name is Cesar Ponce. I am a Codes and Standards Administrator for the Department of Housing, um, better known as HCD. Um, so if I can have a better uh, understanding of who's here um, so I can address or maybe modify my presentation a little better, who here participates in H2A already? If you can raise your hand. Okay, so good, good number of you. Um, Anybody know, can I show, or can you show me who knows of, or knew of HCD prior to today? Okay, perfect. Okay, so HCD is, uh, is, very, is known, or commonly known to handle mobile home parks and mobile homes. Well, guess what? Uh, HCD also handles employee housing, and this is what I'm here to, to talk about. So some of the topics we're going to go over, employee housing program overview. And if I can add, this is intended to be a very high-level um, presentation. I'm not going to get into the weeds. I'm not going to, you know, talk about fees, talk about forms or anything like that. So um, we can answer those questions if you do have questions about fees or whatnot um, later on in the presentation. So we're going to talk about local enforcement agencies. What are they? Uh, the permit to operate, op application inspections, um, time frames, complaints, summary, and contacts. I'm going to give you my phone number and my email address in case you have questions. Uh, maybe you're too shy to ask, or maybe you can't think of a question today, but tomorrow you think of a question and you say, you know, I really want to know more information. So here we go. So I'm not going to read this entire thing, but I want what I want to share with you is that the employee housing program in this, within the state of California is not a new program. The employee housing program was actually enacted back in 1913 um, for, to address uh, employees being housed within the state of California. Um, we follow the law, which is also known as statute and regulation, um, and that's what we enforce. We enforce um, uh, what's in the California Health and Safety Code. These laws are intended to address minimum health and safety issues or concerns. Um, but also, we have cities and counties throughout the state of California who, through an ordinance, have adopted and enforced these standards. We call them local enforcement agencies. Um, and up here, I have the list. What they do is they, they grab the Employee Housing Act and they enforce it within their jurisdiction. Um, City of Gonzales, Monterey County, Napa County, etc. cetera. Um, they are allowed to, once they approve an ordinance, to enforce the Employee Housing Act and the regulations, but not enforce specific ordinances within their cities or the counties, okay? Some of the housing types that we see uh, that are being applied for under the Employee Housing uh, program or single family dwellings, manufactured housing, RVs, hotels, motels, dormitories, apartments, duplexes, railroad cars, cars, and tents. If I can, if I can stress that the employee housing program is not specific for farm labor housing. This program is designed designed to address other types of employee housing as well, such as ski lodges, uh, the railroad car. Uh, example, Barnum & Bailey Circus, when they were around, they'd apply through the employee housing program as well. We'd inspect those carts for substandard conditions, etc. Some of these forms, um, you should know that there is a permit to operate application um, and also a form to, uh, to you tell us when you want us to go out and inspect, typically at a minimum of 45 days prior to occupancy, and the HCD benefits form for uh, citizenship. And if you have questions about those, feel free to call me or you send me an email. So what do we look at during inspections, right? That's, that's a question that I understand um, is, is kind of, people are wanting to know what that's all about. So we, ins we inspect New construction, existing facilities, we inspect for 50, a minimum of 50 square feet per person in sleeping rooms. Uh, we inspect kitchens, community halls, mess halls. We inspect general, general issues like electrical, mechanical plumbing. 
Um, we inspect in areas where there is a piece of land that is designated as agricultural piece of land or property that is housing 12 units, could be manufactured homes or mobile homes or RVs, or 12 units or less. You should know that if you have two or more manufactured homes, mobile homes on one parcel, and you're, those are being rented or leased, even if it's on a piece of agricultural land, guess what? You may qualify as a mobile home park. During our inspections, we also cover the conversion of assembly halls, exhibit halls into dormitories, um, such as a building like this. Uh, throughout the state, we have a housing shortage, so because of that, uh, employers are becoming a little more creative, and they're coming in and using uh, old uh, uh, fair buildings, where it was an assembly hall, now, now they turned it into a dormitory. Well, guess what? If you're going to do that, you need a building permit from the local building department to do that because when the building was built, it, had, it was built to specific requirements in the, in the building code, and now it's a dormitory. Now you need more exits, now you may need windows and uh, uh, fire alarms, uh, sprinklers, etc. So keep that in mind. The inspection process is very simple. You file the application. Uh, the inspector who's designated in that area to inspect that facility will go ahead and contact you. Uh, you do the, he or she does the inspection. If there's violations, you correct them. And um, if there's no violations, you get issued the permit to operate or the PTO. We deal with complaints, um, lack of heat, unsafe electrical mechanical plumbing, lack of exiting, pest infestation, unsanitary conditions, unsafe drinking water, and no cooking facilities, etc. So this is something that <clears throat> might interest you. We as a department, in general, have a program called the uh, Mobile Home Assistance Center. This, this program is designed to assist anybody who, anyone who might have a concern with either a mobile home park, RV park, and employee housing. So if you have a concern regarding employee housing, whether there's substandard conditions or you have a question for the program itself and you want to remain anonymous, let's say, we have an online feature where you can jump online on our website, file the complaint, click the little box that says remain anonymous, and you don't have to provide your name, your number, but we will ask you for the location of the issue and, and we will send somebody out to investigate. That's our website there. I also want to point out that on our website, you can jump onto the employee housing page, and it's going to have all the forms that are required to be filled out, but it's also going to have a, uh, an EH operator booklet. It's an employee housing operator booklet. What that booklet provides, whether you're an operator or not, and you're just curious to see what's required, that booklet's going to have uh, all of those regulations that we enforce, whether it's the 50 square feet, whether it's minimum uh, lighting and ventilation, exiting, etc. So if you just want to read up on that, that's on our website as well. And here's my contact information, my phone number, my email. Um, you should know that Shasta and David are both um, analysts that work, um, that assist me with the employee housing program. I'll get out of your way. Um, and you're more than welcome to contact them and ask a question if, if uh, you don't want to ask me. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions that uh, were submitted. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, rephrase them when they're, uh, or try to understand exactly what they're meaning is. This one says, will you be renting to H-2A workers in residential areas? I think the question is, is housing in residential areas for, or excuse me, is housing of H-2A workers in residential areas permitted? I mean, the answer is yes. 
but you can go ahead and expand on that. Uh, yeah, well, um, when the employer, I mean, I, I, it depends, I guess, right? If uh, uh, what EDD will do is, uh, our job is mainly to verify that the employer is providing adequate housing. If uh, we go out and do an inspection uh, where we're supposed to go, where the employer indicates that that's where the housing is going to be, we use uh, DOL OSHA standards and uh, uh, look at the uh, housing to ensure that it is adequate for the workers. And, uh, but then again, the employer needs to abide by local, state, and federal laws and standards. So if something um, comes first, like a local code or law of that city or that county, whatever it is, uh, that employer m needs to make sure that he is in compliance with that. You, you should know that, um, I, and the reason I gave Roman the, the, the microphone is that the, the question was H-2A specific. I understand that the Department of Housing, although we do, we, although some of the facilities that apply for the employee housing program happen to be H-2A facilities, HCD does not enforce the H-2A program. It's, it's EDD. So, and I wanted to add to what Roman said is, under HCD, if it's an employee housing program, yes, we have the law, yes, we have the regulation, but our laws require that the employee housing facilities, whatever facility is being used, complies with the California Building Standards Codes or the California or Title 24, as some of you might, might, might know it, um, which includes the California Residential Code, Building Code, Electrical Code, Mechanical Code, et cetera. So just because we have a law and a regulation within that body of law, it points us back to the, to the building code. So if, if the employee housing facility changes or modifies that structure, guess what? Our inspector's gonna go out there and we're gonna ask for a building permit from the local building department to say, well, did you do this illegally or not? Um, that ties into this next question. How many H2A, excuse me, how many H-2A workers can occupy a single-family dwelling? I'm sure the answer depends, but uh, I think that we would like some, some range. So, so the answer would de depend, uh, depending on the size of the structure, uh, whether it's a manufactured home, mobile home, RV, um, whether it's a single-family dwelling. Um, typically, as you saw, 50 square foot per person in a sleeping room. Um, so that's the answer. Uh, also... As, as you and I talked about earlier today, uh, can a non-bedroom be used for sleeping uh, or housing of workers? So the room has to be designated as a sleeping area, sleeping room. Keep in mind that the, that the California Residential Code and the California Building Code requires every, sing, every dwelling to, to have a living room, living room, sleeping room, cooking facilities or, or a cooking area, etc. So you can't grab a living room put beds in it and call it a sleeping room. Same thing with manufactured homes. So, but it would be possible uh, to turn an extra, not, not say, say that there was a living room and a family room or a, some, or a converted garage that was legally converted, that could be used for sleeping or housing of workers if it was properly permitted, correct? I would say that the key to that is that legally converted. I would agree. Here's a question. I'm not sure I understand the meaning. It says, are agencies allowed to make contact with H-2A workers? I assume that is both your agencies um, and then other agencies that may have a reason. Um, I'm not sure who submitted that, but... Can you repeat the question? Are agencies allowed to make contact with H-2A workers them directly? So we would... So agencies being HCD would, would contact... Uh, employers, operators, employees, uh, directly or indirectly, as, as a consequence of the, of the PTO application for employee housing under HCD. Uh, yes, and um, we at EDD, we are... Uh, can you hear me? Okay. 
uh, we, we do have uh, our local offices, field offices, have uh, what are called outreach workers that can go to the job sites or housing sites of where those workers are just to provide them information and talk to them to make sure that, uh, uh, just to, to find out how they're doing. If the employer is meeting compliance with the contract, the terms and conditions, uh, and uh, they're also, uh, farm workers in general really can file a complaint at any EDD office uh, against any employer, even against EDD staff, but it's, it's known as the Employment Services Complaint System that's in place in every HACC, America's Job Centers of California. Okay, the next question. What kind of orientation are H-2A workers given when they arrive? Um, and do they have access or information about services like the Mexican consulate or uh, whatever? You know, uh, outside of the process that we have, I am not too familiar and I can't speak for the Department of State, uh, USCIS, Homeland Security, but I understand that they go through a process and the H-2A workers that are coming in uh, to work here in California or anywhere in the United States, are, uh, they go through an interview process and they do a background check to ensure that it's going to be safe for them. You know, we're not allowing anyone that we don't want to come in here. Uh, and sometimes they do turn some workers uh, away uh, from coming in. So they have to go through that process of meeting those uh, background checks and interview that they go through. But uh, that's just what I've, I've heard and that is involved. But I don't work in that agency, of course, and I'm not speaking for them, but that's just... Uh, uh, one of the agencies involved in all of this. As you saw, there's many other agencies. Uh, how are employers advertising for jobs uh, locally? In California, they have to go through uh, the Employment Development Department. That's one of our main purposes is to, to test the labor market in California and in other states to determine, because we're assisting the Department of Labor to determine whether there is in fact a shortage of U.S. workers. So that's why we have the jobs, and that's why we call them job orders, because they are job orders that are submitted to us, those applications that come in. Uh, we enter them in our labor exchange system, which is CalJobs, and I'm familiar, I think you're familiar with that system. It's an online uh, where we match employers to workers. And, and we have also people in the field offices promoting these H-2A job orders to recruit domestic workers because we want to give preference to U.S. workers first before the employer goes outside. But if we don't find any domestic U.S. workers, then the employer is going to, well, Department of Labor will make that call and certify the employer to bring in whatever number of U.S. workers, I mean, uh, yeah, whatever number of U.S. workers they couldn't find here. Uh, this may be more appropriate for one of our uh, farm, empl farm employers out there. Uh, the question is, how much more does it cost an employer to hire, house, uh, and provide, et cetera, for an H-2A worker versus a domestic farm worker? All right, I got it. Hold on a second. What's your name? Christina. Hi, I'm Christina. I've done a lot of projections on this because our growers want to know that and it just depends on the length of the contract because the longer the contract that you can get your costs down a little bit but it costs up to twenty dollars an hour or more per h2a worker um, to be here compared to minimum wage for a domestic worker thank you have anything else to add on that okay another question for edd how can Everything get done in 75 days or less to vet a worker. Um, in some cases, a visa can take three to five years to get. Obviously, this is a special expedited visa, but how do you get it done in 75 days or less? Well, uh, for us, our process, again, uh, this does not include, you know, we don't issue the visas. We don't issue the H-2A visas. Uh, we're basically making sure that what's on that job order is... Uh, 
in compliance with the terms and conditions of that contract. You know, how many hours you're going to work a week, uh, how much the employee is going to get paid, uh, the job description to make sure it's, uh, uh, it's uh, legal, there's nothing there that will preclude any U.S. workers from applying, what tools are you going to be used, uh, how often you're going to pay, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we look for. If something like that is missing, we ask the employer to include it. Or if there's language there that's discriminatory language or uh, in violation of California law, we'll ask the employer to remove that as well. Uh, so that process for us, uh, I mean, we, we, we process those in that amount of time because we, as soon as we review the, the job order, if it's, it's, we have, what, seven days? We have seven days to review it and let the employer know whether the, it's acceptable or not. Once we accept it, it could be in two, three days, right, after we review it, then we post the job order into our uh, CalJob system and begin recruitment. Then the employer, we send them a notice telling them, uh, your application has been accepted, we open a job order, you're going to hear from us with uh, referrals, and the employer then has to submit the application package, which includes our job order, the ETA 790 form, and another form that's uh, ETA 9142A to the Chicago National Processing Center, which is Department of Labor, uh, within uh, 45, 45 days before the start date. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to rephrase the question. I think the question was, how can you possibly do all this in such a short period of time? Uh, I mean, you must have a very large staff oh, or a very a yeah, yeah. lot of people working on this. I mean, if, if it's two or three people processing it, then it's going to get backlogged. How, how do you do it? You know, especially with the increase, I have uh, seven analysts working in my office that are uh, all involved in the review of those job orders, uh, among other things that, that we also have to do. Uh, so we're keeping up uh, with the demand. Um, so right now we're we're managing, but it is uh, it is tough because uh, the the program continues to grow. So. so I guess that's a question I have. If it <laughs> continues to grow as expected, we saw the yes. rates increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, is there going to be a funding issue? I mean, if, if, are they going to extend yeah. the time period so that you can accommodate? Yeah. Seventy-five days does seem very quick to me. Sure. Yeah, the the funding we get our funding from Department of Labor, and uh, it just uh, Congress appropriates so much money for the, all of the states, and we receive, we apply for the grant, uh, and uh, every year, that's a renewable grant, uh, so we have to apply for that funding sometimes. Uh, well, of course, we would like to have as much funding as possible to be able to do all the work that we have in that plan, uh, uh, work plan that we, we propose. Uh, Thank you. All right, next question. What happens when H-2A workers become ill uh, or need ho hospitalization or are injured on the job? What, what rules apply? The Department of Labor, California, what? You know, I, I wish Ruben Lugo was here today because he's with the Wage and Hour Division and he has a, a good answer for that. We really, the, we just got just to gotta remember that the employer has to comply with all state laws. Uh, and sometimes it may not be in a law, but I think there's best practices. And this employer here, uh, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Yeah, Christina, Christi Christina's going to favor us again with another better answer. better answer that you. question for me. Um, H-2A workers are covered by workers' comp 24-7. So as long as they're using the housing or transportation and then like a normal, what we've been told is in a normal practice, any injury or illness, they'll be covered through workers' comp. Thank you. Thank you. In what countries are H-2A workers recruited, and who does this? In California, we've seen mainly the Mexico. And the, once the employers are approved to, or certified to bring in foreign workers, the employer has to conduct that recruitment at that other, at the, in the other country. So it, it is, they have different methods that they use. They may have a, uh, a recruiter, they may have uh, 
an employee that goes out to to Mexico to recruit workers uh, or a number of other you know ways that they do it but it is the responsibility of the employers to go recruit in that other country and bring them in uh, part of the same card uh, next question how are the workers vetted you know again it, it's the the, the vetting uh, at the government level is the Department of State that it has to go through. They go to that interview, like I mentioned earlier, at the embassy, I believe. But if you want to add something to that, I'm glad you're here because you go through that every time. Oh, you should just come on up. You want to come up here? It's a pen. <laughs> The consulate, I mean, they go through biometrics, fingerprints, photographs. They go through all the Department of Transportation um, logs in the United States. They look to see if there's any unlawful presence. They look, they look at a lot of different things. But as far as getting specifics, I, I don't know. I don't work for the consulate. It's through the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Thank you once again. Uh, I think this question has been partially mm -hmm. answered. Yeah. What is the cost of the employer? And who pays for the transportation, food, and housing? And what about medical? Um, I think I can handle this one. The, uh, the housing and the transportation have to be paid by the employer uh, at, at the cost. Um, the food, you, they have to be provided with a kitchen and access to grocery store to make their own, to buy their own food and make their own food, or they can be charged a specific amount for per meal. And I'm going to let you answer the rest of that question. Uh, if they are provided meals, they can be charged uh, uh, an amount, but I don't think it covers the full cost. Yes, I believe, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 12, 12, oh, 1226. Okay, I was going to say 1227. So the employer uh, can deduct uh, 12, 1226 uh, for three meals every day, um, and the employer has to provide uh, the, the meals um, every day of the week if the workers are not provided with free and accessible kitchen facilities. All right, and the last written question, oh, what about medical? I think we answered that. That was uh, workers' comp. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to also point out, if uh, I may have not mentioned, that employers, first, they need to recruit here in the United States, in California, to to find any U.S. workers that are interested to work here. And employers really cannot refuse uh, to hire a U.S. worker if that worker is qualified, able, willing, and available at the time of the, the for the duration of the contract. So the employer has to provide a, a lawful job-related reason for not hiring that person, and that has to be documented so that the Department of Labor knows why they refuse to hire uh, any U.S. workers. And I think wage in our division, Ruben uh, Lugo, who is the one that does these forums a lot, uh, has mentioned those are pretty hefty fines if an employer refuses to hire a U.S. worker. And I think you know that. <laughs> the, uh, the last question, I think, is a little too general to answer, and maybe whoever submitted it when we go to the open mic uh, can explain it a little better. It says, what are the guidelines and rules once workers are here? Uh, I think that's just, it's too broad. So uh, I would like to, uh, we, no more written questions, so I would like to uh, open up for uh, questions. I One, two, and then three, okay. Uh, when you're looking at the rental agreements and verifying those, um, who, who is the uh, lessee going to be? Is that the employer or is it going to be the occupant? And I'm wondering, the term, is there a certain minimum or a maximum term? Yes, yeah, so the uh, employer's name is going to be on the contract um, as they are going to be seen as a tenant. Uh, the limited term, the, the term on the, on the contract will just be independent. We're not involved in any of, of that. Um, as far as the H-2A program goes, it could be uh, the workers could be here from three months to ten months, so we look, we'll take it. Yeah, we'll accept it. Up to ten months. Yeah. What are uh, some of the 
common complaints or concerns that you have with housing or food in this program? So the complaints that we receive from from who specifically? From farm workers or from? So just to frame the question, if. Excuse me, this mic's a little louder. Why don't we use this one? So as we mentioned earlier, we have a complaint system in place. Uh, farm workers, uh, we take complaints from farm workers uh, if they're provided or not provided with the adequate uh, working conditions or housing or anonymous sources uh, as well. Um, so basing it on that, uh, I would say that wages is one of the top complaints from farm workers. They're either not getting paid the adequate amount because they're getting paid less than the, than the AWER, which is the adverse effect wage rate, um, which for the state of California, it's currently at 13.18 an hour, uh, or they're not getting paid overtime. Um, and if they're getting paid piece rate, then that even becomes a little bit more complicated for them to understand if they're getting paid correctly or not. So I would say that that's one. Um, and the second one I would say would be the, the housing. Um, at times they are, are moved around before they actually are, are we're notified and then uh, the Chicago National Processing Center, which is the Department of Labor, before they're notified as well. So that's also in violation. And, and that's, that's another thing as well. Thank you, Roman. So uh, re related to housing, um, since we know that this is kind of the primary concern here, uh, this is also something that we've, that we've seen is that the, there's multiple employers using one particular housing location. So uh, now that we're collaborating with HCD, uh, we have increased our communication on a biweekly basis where there's uh, conferences and we kind of you know, address concerns that we have regarding vetting out these permits to operate that, that HCD issues the employer. And we want to make sure that um, if we're receiving the PTOs from the employer, that there's uh, no overcrowding, right? That there aren't, that this particular PTO isn't used multiple times. And if I, if I can add to that, uh, one, of the, one of the more common complaints that we get are, is, you know, lack of heating and, and lack of uh, cooking facilities. Um, but that, that's a result of having the, our inspector, HED inspector, go out, inspect the housing facility, issue the permit to operate or the PTO, and then having the, uh, the employer, after that facility is approved, house those employees somewhere else. So it may be that those, those, those employees are being housed at a facility that may have not have been inspected and approved where, you know, HTD may have approved some, another facility or the facility that was on their, uh, their uh, application. Hello, I'm Mike Motes. I'm the city councilman for the city of Santa Maria. And I'd like to address what I consider to be the 800-pound gorilla in the front room. Our city of Santa Maria enacted an emergency ordinance earlier this year limiting the number of H-2A workers in a single-family residence in a quiet residential street to six persons. The emergency ordinance lasted 30 days and was not renewed because of a lot of confusion about the H-2A issue, which I think is leading to all of the organizational presentations we're having now. Is there any precedent for limiting the number of H-2A workers that can live in a house? And is such a limitation legal? So, so the, the way I'm going to answer your question is there's no number of employees that, that a facility can be limited to. It's more, I'm going to refer back to that 50 square foot per person in a sleeping room. Um, and that's the limitation. So depending on uh, the, the square footage of the facility, the sleeping rooms, et cetera. Um, I know that there is a specific section in the California Health and Safety Code that 
does not allow cities and counties to treat a single family dwelling any different where there is uh, six or fewer employees uh, in, a, um, in a single family dwelling. But I, I don't know if that really answers your question. So. So again, employees under the employee housing program, which it may be uh, H-2A employees as well, in a sleeping room, that the, there needs to be 50 square foot per person in that sleeping room. Understand that per the California Building Standards Code or Title 24, every single family dwelling has to have a living room, a kitchen, cooking facilities, et cetera, bathroom, which means that in a bathroom or in a living room, they, there cannot, it cannot be used for sleeping purposes. Therefore, if you have a 100 square foot room and each, each employee has to have a minimum of 50 square feet, then you have two employees. If you have the, square, the 50 square foot per person, Possibly. Okay. Now, what if I own the house next to your house? You're a quiet residential area. They're all your neighbors. And all of a sudden, you have 10 persons from a different culture, single males, military age, without the civilizing principles of female companions. How would you feel about that? How would that affect your property values? How would you feel about your personal safety? Well, my, my answer to your question is going to go back to the, to the law. The law states that that's possible, it's a possibility, and if it's 50 square feet per person that's being provided, then that's allowed. Um, so we've, we, we heard from EDD that we had five inspectors, I think, housing inspectors, and we've gone now to HCD. Are they going to increase the numbers of inspectors? How are they going to handle this? this great wave of new inspections that need to take place? Uh, so great, great question. So for those that didn't he, uh, couldn't hear, she, she asked if, is HTD going to more or less increase the number of inspectors to, to do these inspections? Uh, we are in the process of, of working on that. We're working on that. So ideally, uh, if our proposal gets uh, approved, we will. Um, but currently, the inspectors that, that we have doing employee housing they also do complaints in mobile home parks. They do construction inspections. They do employee housing inspections. So they're, they're really um, stretched thin. So to answer your question, we're working on that, and that's the idea. Yes, I'm just working off Dr. Moat's question. Was our city in noncompliance by passing that 30-day period ordinance, allowing only six persons per household? Or other cities and other counties or other areas also passed ordinances and gone around the state law by doing so by the county or by the city to allow that six-person limit? You know, I, I, I can answer your question by saying that I know Mr. Cinco um, has worked with, our, with HCD to develop uh, such, a, such an ordinance, um, but I personally have not dove into it, so I cannot answer your question whether yes or no. Um, I can tell you that... Um, Mr. Cinco researched the, uh, the laws and the regulations and, and worked around that, so. What I could do is I, can, I could definitely grab your email and I'll send you an email or a phone call and answer your question after I, after I dive into it. Okay, um, you'll know which question I asked as soon as I finish my question. If you guys can't tell us how the workers got vetted, who can? Can you give us the numbers to, or the website to tell us who vetted these people that are living in our neighborhood? I know if somebody buys a house in our neighborhood, we don't know who they are, but they're vetted into our neighborhood. The H2As 
are, they're, they don't care about our neighborhoods. Most, I'm not saying that all of them, but most of them don't care. They're not vetted into our neighborhood or into our cities. They're here to work and leave, which I'm not saying anything about. But being in a neighborhood, you, you know, you want somebody in there that's going to be there and that's going to help you in your neighborhood and take care of your neighborhood. So who can we find out how they are vetted and stuff? I see what you're saying. And you know what? When we were finishing our, our PowerPoint presentation, we had some uh, links for you. And we can bring them up, uh, Mr. Cinco, if you would like. But yeah, there are, I think we have Department of Labor, Department of State, and a few others. But the process that they go through, I, I, I'm not familiar with it because I can't speak for them. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we should consider that, or Mr. Cinco should consider that in future uh, meetings like these. I would, I think that'd be that'd be great. Once again, Sometimes mentioning the city council, with the uh, we hear figures on the city council that there are people living with 20 and 30 workers in a home. Um, I'm not real quick with math, but I did a little of the math. And that's a pretty big home to house 30 legal uh, H-2A workers. D do you know of any facilities that are housing up to 30 that are single-family dwellings? I can tell you that going back, um, kind of combining all of, all of my answers and part of my presentation, that if, if there are 10, I don't know, 10, 15 employees in one single-family dwelling, they may be using the, the garage that may have been converted. I, I don't know. Um, that's also a possibility, converted into a sleeping area. The idea is that that garage, if it was converted uh, to a, increase the number of employees in that facility, um, would have gone through the building permit process. And if it was, uh, and they have those 50 square foot per person, then that, that might very well be a possibility. Okay. I was impressed to hear that... Uh, <clears throat> somebody, your inspectors ask for what, when you can tell that a home has been modified, you're asking them for building permits to make sure that that modification was done legally with the local building department. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And can you, can somebody give me the answer to what happens to a person if they step out of bounds? Either the, either the employee, the, the uh, migrant worker, or the facility owner or operator. What happens to them? What are the sanctions placed on them? Uh, I, and I ask that question because it, it kind of relates to, do I want to risk it? I mean, if, if I'm going to drive on the freeway and I know it, I can drive 70 miles an hour and not worry about it too much, I'm probably going to do that. But if I drive 70 miles an hour and I know that there's a $500 fine for that five miles an hour, the speed limit, I'm not going to do that. So can you answer that question as to what the sanctions are against someone who violates their contract, the legal contract? Okay, so you're out of bounds, meaning they violate the contract some way, somehow. Okay. The H-2A contract. Yeah, and again, it would be the enforcement arm of the uh, H-2A program, which is the Wage and Hour Division, Department of Labor. They have, I understand, investigators, uh, they go out and they do cite uh, employers that are in violation. I know that. It's a fact because there's uh, that information is on their website and you can find out what types of uh, uh, violations employers are involved, what are the fines, citations, the consequences. Uh, I, that's Wage and Hour Division. There's also uh, Chicago National Processing Center. If they, because we, we may notify Chicago National Processing Center if there's a violation that came in that we uh, elevated to wage and hour division, we notify Chicago National Processing Center and they will tag that in case, uh, because they may, not, they may have to go out to do an audit uh, that may result in uh, discontinuing services, or what is it called? Uh, debarring, uh, department, debarment of uh, employers using the H-2A program. So there are some uh, 
uh, negative consequences. Uh, but if you go, I know the Wage and Hour Division's website has a lot of data on that. Okay, I have another question. As you can tell, I'm, um, like, like Dr. Motes had said, his house is a five bedroom. He would get 10 people in. I know of a house that's 1,100, and they have 10 people in. They, it's a three bedroom. Two of the bedrooms are 10, 10 by 10, and one is, I'll say, 12 by 12. How are they getting 10 people in there? And they're, they've got the license. Um, yeah, that uh, I can answer that question. If I mean the measurements are the measurements. If there's three bedrooms, and you can get two, four, five, seven people, and there's no other um, bedrooms, no other sleeping rooms, then they would be in violation. And and I know, I, I know that uh, I've talked to uh, EDD in the past, and and I'm sure HCD would say they can inspect and confirm if there's been a violation. So, so if I can add to that, so thank you for that, uh, Mr. Cinco. Now, going back to what I said earlier, it may be that we, we uh, as a state agency, inspected a specific address, and then those, those employees got moved. Now, without understanding or knowing the specific address, I can't really answer your question, but I can give you a resource. That mobile home assistance center number that I put up, it's a complaint line, is what it is. So if you have an employee housing complaint or a concern that you want someone to look into, please uh, either email or call that number, and we can definitely look at the application, send an inspector out and say, well, how many employees do you have here? And you were, let's say, in this specific instance, if that facility was approved for four employees or five employees, and now, have, now they have 10 or 11, though that's a violation. So then. Well, if, if, go ahead. I, I believe that um, the answer would come from HCD because we issued the permit to operate. So if you have a specific question, you have my number. Um, please call my number or just, just call the, uh, the assistance center and we can definitely look into it. Um, I have one follow-up to that. Do you say that we did get a complaint at the city level Somebody said that there's too many workers, more than more than uh, more than are supposed to be there under the permit. Will you do a reinspection, um, or will you do it in the evening? Will you do a surprise inspection? How does that work? So, so absolutely. We, if we receive a complaint, um, let's say the complaint is uh, 10 employees in a 1,100 square foot home. Well, you know that would be that would be considered substandard. Um, if they didn't have the uh, the uh, adequate square footage, right? So, yes, we would we do we would do a follow up inspection, um, potentially you know revisit their their permit to operate, maybe revoke or suspend or whatever whatever the case may be. Um, but there are, there are there are tools for you to to help with uh, to help um, address the issue. So, I. I have one more question. I just need clarification. I'm sorry if everybody else understood it, but I didn't. Uh, we have an H2A housing group of people, and they're playing at the park, and one of them breaks their leg. They are covered 24-7 under work comp. Am I misunderstanding you? Or is that then become the community, you know, they go to the hospital, and then it's taken care of? I'm going to let Christina answer that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you did say 24-7. I... Okay. Hold on a second. So if they get burned making dinner, if they get food poisoning, if they get... Um, we had an employee assaulted walking down Main Street or Broadway. Um, that's, that was all covered by work comp. All right, well, that, all right, she basically said that they'd had employees assaulted, uh, burned, uh, cooking dinner, and that was covered under workers' comp. I, I will find out the answer, and, and we can talk later about that. That's a good question. Well, it's part of the workers' comp because it's employee, so we'll, we'll get you the answer. 
at one at one time, uh, H2A was going to be in the county. It was going to be in big dormitories. And, and so why can't big box stores that are empty in Santa Maria be turned into housing for H2 workers? You, ha you have, uh, you have the, the parking lots there to turn into recreational. They're close. We have mass transportation. You could have a, a cafeteria kitchen where you're making meals so they don't have to cook. They don't want to cook if they come home tired. I mean, this way it, it, it's the same, but it's in city limits. It's close to everything. It's not in a neighborhood. Neighborhoods weren't built for borders. Yeah, I'm afraid they're, they're not able to answer that question. They're, it's, they're, they live in Sacramento. So. But, but what I can tell you, with that county, that cities and counties work the same across the state. And I can say that because I, I work with cities and counties across the state. So to answer your question, if, a, if an employer or even a building owner wanted to convert that where old warehouse, old Sam's Club, old Costco, whatever it is that it, that, that building was, all they have to do is go through the, the proper building channels at the planning department, fire department, building department, and get the proper permits, convert it, and when the, when the application comes to, uh, I'll say, e, uh, EDD for that facility, and then the paperwork comes to HTD on our form to say this is the facility we're going to use, if the permits were obtained and they have the square footage, we're going to look at the building permits, we're going to look at the location, and I can't tell you, I'm not going to say that it's not allowed, it's just that proper work has to be done to that, to that building in order to turn it into a dormitory type of use. Hold on a sec, we, for the recording. You don't come out, you don't go out and recruit homes or facilities? HCD does not recruit. We, we inspect what the employer wants us to, um, uh, to, to use as employee housing. My, my question is, what is your definition of of kitchen facilities. Is it a stove? Is it a hot plate? Is it an oven? Is it a sink to wash dishes? It's cooking facilities is, is what it comes down to in that kitchen. That's what I'm asking. What is the definition? Uh, well, I don't have my book with me, but I can definitely get it for you. Um, I know that um, a kitchen could include um, a mess hall, um, a community kitchen, or okay. in a single family dwelling. Okay, so I guess my question is, if they have one room, they cannot have a hot plate or two in there in a room? Well, that goes back to the definition of a dwelling unit. So the dwelling unit has to have cooking, a cooking area, right? So you okay. can't cook in your room. Okay, thank you. An oven, I know that an oven is not required, just a cooktop. Um, hi, my question is, um, I would like to know if the actual workers um, have any restrictions or if they have free time during the time that they're not working. Okay, so your question is, are, uh, are the workers restricted when they're not working? Yeah. Um, so these are guest workers. So just as any of you would have guests over your home, uh, you would treat them as such. So that, with that being said, is while they're under the control of the employer, they have to abide by their rules, right? Just as, as any type of employment. Uh, outside of that, the employer can have housing rules as the employer is going to provide housing to these workers. Um, if they're not working, it, they, that, that would be considered their, their leisure time. And they would be able to do whatever they wanted to during that time. Or, or do the employers um, you know, tell them that they're not allowed to leave the, their quarters or their facility where they're housed? Yeah, I mean, are, are you asking illegal activities, and, and et cetera, et cetera? No. Those, you know, of course, that's our, those are employers' rules. But I think what you're asking is, are they free to, to, you know, go to the store, go to the church, go meet with friends? It's, yeah, they, they, they are. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, my second question to that is, what are the proper channels um, or process that we could use uh, to speak to the actual workers? 
you as a as an employer or, i mean are you t are you an employer yes. and you you well, want to talk to the workers yes for, um, for example something that we might be able to do and i'm not saying it's going to happen but um, as a lady was saying back here um, if they need assistance in knowing what's right or wrong how they should be picking up things like that um, that could somebody talk to them could they gather them up and and give them you know a, a 30 minute speech on you know something like that yeah yeah and, and I think employers have best practices uh, I know some well-established employers have used the H2A program for quite some time. Uh, I think the key is having constant communication with the workers, uh, explaining very clearly what, what, uh, what the contract is about, uh, handing them a copy of the contract so that they know what the terms and conditions of that contract are, what the expectations are, so I think uh, being able to communicate with them uh, and just just talk to them. Uh, and I know that there's some employers here that probably have that uh, in place and it's working well with them. And if you guys want to share some best practices or anything, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Follow up. In my neighborhood right now, there are probably, I'm not saying they're H-2A workers living in the homes, but there are three homes and for one home for five years now, and this is with families living in there, there's still no curtains on the windows. Neither of the land, none of the landscaping is on any of the houses, and it's bringing down our property value of, you know, people that live there. So how can there be 20 men in a home, what's that house going to look like? There's no buy-in to that. Um, I can answer that a little bit. Uh, we do have code enforcement uh, in the city of Santa Maria. If there's a uh, violation, complaint can be made. Uh, well, that, that could be a violation. It could be a violation. Of, uh, it, it could be, depending on if, if it's overgrown or whatnot. A uh, lot of people don't have but maybe one or two people in their houses and the landscaping is non-existent so it's it's a case-by-case -case situation excuse me over here just a really quick answer the window coverings are required for h2a housing good to know but not for every normal uh, regular residents uh, you know what I provide housing for HOA uh, employees um, and I can tell you right now uh, if there's ever any issues I just call the employer and directly and it's taken care of right away there is never an issue um, and I've been very happy with them Excuse me. <laughs> I just have a quick comment. I don't know what you guys envisioned when all this started up, um, bringing H2E workers over, but there is a housing shortage here in Santa Maria. And some of these homes that are going to H2A workers could be used as housing for people that actually live in Santa Maria. I've heard stories of uh, people kicking people out of their homes in order to bring in H2E workers. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of situations like that, but that's, that, that's a horrible scene, um, you know, to kick somebody out just to bring in H2E workers because they're going to make more money. I don't know if you guys ever heard stories like that, but um, I don't know what you guys envisioned when all this came up. I mean, where were they going to be housed? That lady said, I am concerned with my property value. I don't know who these people are. I have nothing against H2A, you know, but just them coming into the, into the neighborhood and living in our neighborhood. But from what I hear, we can't do anything about it. Am I, am I right? That's a really complicated question, and that's part of the reason we're 
holding these forums, we're trying to gather information to see what the city's options are with respect to potentially regulating um, H-2A housing and some of the, uh, the issues that you've talked about. Well, one of the big issues that's been brought up at all of these meetings is that there's been a lot of these warehouses that are out there that are not being utilized and there might be properties around town that aren't being utilized. But there, it takes a huge investment to get anything done, to build something. It's millions and millions of dollars. And I think people don't realize, unless you have the security of being able to do that, then you're not going to go out and invest. No one, no entity is going to go out and invest millions and millions of dollars and not know that it's going to work. So that's why a lot of this has to be figured out before you know, anyone, whether it be myself or my family or any other uh, land-owning entity that's in this valley, uh, there needs to be some security, and that's why these meetings, in my view, that's why these meetings are very important, because you can't go into something, and it would help the situation if there was more developed, but there needs to be a risk assessment, and that's the big thing in, in anything like this. So it's, it sounds like there's a uh a few thousand H2A workers in the city of Santa Maria during a season now. And so, like, um, there's got to be some facilities that have a lot of workers in them. I don't know, maybe hotels or they might have hundreds of them and, uh, you know, 100 workers in a particular spot. So what has happened? Is there statistics on what's happened to, to crime and safety in those areas? Um, from when it was just allowed to be open to the public and have the public rent the rooms versus what the crime rate's like now when there's an employer housing H2A workers there. Thank you, John. Uh, we, uh, we don't have any statistics, but we do have one, one particular property that was uh, a hotel on Broadway that was, that received about 300 calls for service a month and it was a, uh, true cesspool of uh, crime. It was a real problem and um, the, uh, it was purchased and turned into essentially uh, a hotel for H2A workers and it's been operating as such and there have been no complaints for service or no complaints, no requests for service. So it had a very positive effect and I will also add that a lot of, from a code enforcement perspective, a lot of houses that have had code enforcement cases, but became, because they were kind of run down and they were purchased by uh, agricultural employers uh, and turned into H-2A housing, the code enforcement cases essentially were reduced, uh, the violations were reduced significantly. So it, there have been some very positive impacts with respect to uh, the condition of property from, from H-2A. And to answer your other question about the number of workers, there's, I can't remember the statistics, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's about 1,900 workers, right, this, or at least in 2017 there was 1,900 H-2A workers in the city of Santa Maria, and about 900 of them were housed in the hotels. So a little, little, just a little over half. Uh, I saw a question, yeah, Mickey. Okay, I believe there's an ordinance in the state of California as to how many people can live in a single family, family dwelling. And when, a sing, and when a single family dwelling becomes, when you start renting rooms, that becomes a, um, a boarding house. And you must have a, a permit to have a boarding house. Uh, I'm familiar with that as well. She is talking about a definition of a boarding house that the state attorney general approved. It, dealt with three or more rooms rented out uh, to individuals on separate rental agreements. Not sure that it applies because there's usually one party that rents the house and then the others are provided. Even if it did apply, the employee housing code says that for six or fewer, you can't use a boarding house. You can't define it as a boarding house. So there's the question whether you, more than six could be used as a boarding house definition. That's an un, unanswered question, but thank you for raising that. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. It's hard to see everybody. Here you go. 
what happens if an H-2A worker gets in trouble with the law and do H-2A workers, are they allowed to have their own vehicles? Uh, okay, I guess I got to answer that one. Uh, it, my understanding is that they, if they get in trouble with the law, I mean, assume, assuming that they're not necessarily criminally prosecuted here, uh, if they just get in trouble or if they're not complying with the terms of the contract, correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, uh, they can be just basically uh, re returned. So there's, they're, if, if they're, they're there, they have to comply with the contract and uh, the rules, and if they don't, they can be, that's a violation of the contract and they can be returned. And I'm sorry, your second question was, oh, yes, they can own cars. They're, they can own cars. They, uh, not sure about the driving license issue. People that they have to, I, I mean, when, it, when people go to foreign countries, they don't have to apply for a driver's license to drive a vehicle if it's, they're you know, on a visa. Uh, that's a good question that Council Member Waterford said about what about insurance. Uh, they would be legally required to have insurance. Uh, whether they do or not is a is different issue, I, but they would be legally required to have that insurance. They can own a car. And I have heard that there are actually more of the workers buying cars and taking them back uh, to Mexico. Um, okay. Next. Hi. Um, the, the question is, the notion of making Santa Maria its own local enforcement agency, and Mr. Sinco will grimace because we talked about it a little bit, but if I understand the numbers correctly here in the Valley, then we have about 10% of all the H-2A workers as of like this year in all of California. That's a pretty big chunk. And a lot of concerns are, well, we're not getting responses. We have to call Sacramento to, fi to find out whether that's legal to have those people in there. Well, why don't we just bring it local? Because I think Mr. Simcoe and the farm owners are right, is that some of the cleanest operating rental properties in the city are H-2A managed. And if only all properties that have field workers and other workers, Anglos, were as well managed, you know, you just snap your fingers and problems were taken care of, we could make some advances. So I would ask that the council persons, you know, th think about that notion. And I know, I know code compliance is, oh my God, that's the last thing we need. We're chasing roosters and, and feral shopping carts all over town. We can't be bothered with this. But, but, but I think that might be a direction to go in. I can respond real quick. Uh, that we would be happy to do it if we had funding. Um, I'll, I'll let I'll let Roman answer the question about that. About how how can a local entity become the local enforcement agency for uh, HCD? Sure. So so it is a possibility, as you saw in my in my presentation um, earlier, that some some counties or cities do become local enforcement agencies. Um, the reason that um, they did that is for the reason that you just explained, is if, you, if you're in a city, you'll have a better idea, a better pulse, if you will, on what's going on, and you, you, you may be able to respond maybe in a quicker fashion or understand better what's going on with the housing issues. Um, so to do that, um, you as a city would have to uh, enact a, an ordinance assuming the responsibility as it, as it relates to the Employee Housing Act, um, and you would be able to enforce the Employee Housing Act and the regulations as well. So that's how you would do that. Uh, and the city attorney's rec office would probably be okay with that because it would probably fall upon the, uh, the building department, so that would be all right. So the permit, the, we, HCD, would not fund that, uh, but what would happen is uh, everything involved with the Employee Housing Act, including collecting fees for the permits to operate, would help with that. Okay, so tonight I've gotten a couple questions that I've gotten other answers before, like the, how many people on thing, and now they can have cars. Our street is already so packed with cars because we have, you know, and, there, and there's 10 people and they're going to bring in new cars. They already have two cars there and we're thinking they just got them. So if there's more cars, that's not fair to us. I'm sorry, you know, they already get the bus to come pick them up in our streets, and they wanted to park the bus there, and we, they decided not to. 
Now, would they, besides the bus, they can also bring in cars. You know, something has to be... And like I said before, my husband worked out in the field. He used to travel the circuit. He went all the way to Florida, all over. And there wasn't a problem because they lived on the land that they worked. That's where they stayed. They knew what they were going into. The, you know, and they didn't bother the people. Or they lived on mot in motels on the edge of town. And they could go in. The farmers would take them in. Or they had their own cars. And they would go in. They, and they said they, and I've talked to quite a few of them that went with my husband years ago. They would never have stayed in a house where families were. Okay. Oh, this, you first. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm with a local, uh, we do hire H2A, and I, to answer your question, even though they can purchase vehicles, they can get a driver license, we don't allow them to park the vehicles. We tell them, if you're going to purchase a vehicle, you need to have somewhere else to park it with a relative because we're not, you're not going to park it here. That's so avoid that issue. Yes. Yes, you're absolutely right, Cheryl. The, uh, that's why we're having this meeting. We're gathering information so we can present options for the council's consideration with respect to those kinds of things. That is true. Yeah, the housing regulation here in California is very much different than it is any place else in the country, and especially in Santa Barbara County. So you have to understand that the, the, the cost of building in this county are astronomical. And we, and we face that competition from those other states. So you have to understand it's, it's, a, it's an economic issue. Saw a question over. Okay. Oh, that young lady, and then, then you, sir. So I guess my comment, it would be towards you. Have you addressed that issue to the, to the, to the employer, to the company? Because I'm also an H-2A, and if, my, if any of my neighbors were to complain, I would totally find an agreement between them. So have you addressed that issue to them? I understand, but sometimes, like, for example, us, we try our best to not affect any community, so I feel like it's towards everybody, and I know there's bad apples. There's always going to be bad apples, but it's not. I'm sorry, this, this really isn't appropriate for a conversation like this, so let's get back to the questions, especially for our panelists who haven't been, I haven't been keeping them very busy, so let's ask a good question here. Well, I just wanted to, to respond to some of the comments that some of the residents um, have made. Um, the, uh, the vetting process, it's, it starts with the employer in our case. Um, you know, we, we actually directly hired our, our workers. So we went to Mexico and we interviewed uh, a bunch of uh, people. And then once we narrowed it down to the best ones we wanted, um, then, you know, the government vets them at the consulate. And if they have any background, any any uh, criminal background, they can't get a visa. So that's kind of the vetting process, I think, that, and that's better than our other 800 employees that we have no idea what their background is. So it's, it's actually better to have an H-2A employee in that sense, because you know that they don't have a criminal background. As far as the 24-7 uh, work comp, I can only speak for myself. Um, if they get injured at work, Yes, they're covered 100% like any employee because they're, they're a legal employee. And, um, but we had a, a case where an employee was feeling chest pain. He was at our, our, one of our houses, and um, it was totally non-work related. I called the Department of Labor, and I asked them. And the person I spoke to didn't even know the answer. 
he had to talk to a senior officer that specialized in H2A, and then he got back to me, and he said that definitely not. You're not responsible for non-work-related injuries. So we gave him a ride to the hospital, and he took care of it. So um, I just wanted to share. That's just my personal experience. I can't speak for other information that other employers may have. Thank you. Well, that's certainly an issue I'll be looking into before the next meeting. Any other questions? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. All right. Uh, any final comments from our panelists? Uh, well, no, thank you. Thank you for having, uh, having me and, and being able to at least answer some of your concerns. Uh, please, by all means, give me a call or, or email me if you have a question. Or if you want to remain anonymous and file a complaint, please feel free to, to file a complaint online. Um, you're more than welcome to do that, and we can investigate whatever your concern is. Thank you. Do you have any final comments? I was just going to say ditto. Oh, I mean, okay. yes, <laughs> you have our contact information there. Uh, we're, we were glad to have been here to provide as much information as possible about what our role is. And uh, I know that there's employer forums on H2A. Wage and Hour Division participates in those. So look out for those if you're an employer or looking into using the H2A program because those are ed educational forums that go more in-depth as to the enforcement of the H2A program. Can we, uh, can we have a good round, warm of, of round of applause for our panelists? Thank you all for coming and have a good night. <laughs>